But before we, get, we begin, uh, we need to recognize that our First Nations have participated in all of Canada's major military conflicts. And during the Second World War, they were involved in every service and every theater of the conflict that Canada participated in. We also acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Anishinaabeg people, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation through the Between the Lakes Purchase, Purchase Number 3 Treaty of 1792. The Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lake Huron, Ontario, and Lake Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commit to the truth and reconciliation to calls to action. We must do more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history, and its people. This commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Our speaker is uh, Dana Weiner, uh, and she's an associate professor of history at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. She teaches about the early United States race, slavery, and Civil War era, among other topics. She's an alumna of uh, the University of California at San Diego and Northwestern University. Her research explores race, identity, citizenship, and grassroots politics. And she's been awarded fellowships from several institutions, including the Huntington Library. Uh, Dana's publications include the book, Chapters, Legal Ambiguities on the Ground, Black Californians, Land Claims, 1848 to 1870, and Debating the Place of African Americans in California, 1850 to 1870. In 2013, she published a book about anti-slavery and anti-black law activism, race and rights, fighting slavery and prejudice in the old Northwest, 1830 to 1870. Her current research is about race, property, and citizenship claims among free people of African descent in Northern California. I'd like to welcome uh, Dana to our uh, military lecture series, and I'm really looking forward to your talk tonight. Thanks for coming with us, Dana. The delights of remote remote speaking. Uh, all right, uh, so I am unmuted now. Uh, thank you so much to uh, to Ken for that great introduction, and um, thank you to Guelph Museums and also the Laurier Center for Military and Disarmament Studies for uh, co-sponsoring this event along with the museums. Um, and also thank you to the wonderful staff at Guelph Museums for making this so easy, even as it is uh, rather odd to be delivering a lecture from my house. All right, and also thank you, audience, for your interest in this talk. In a pro-enlistment address from July of 1863, Frederick Douglass argued, quote, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letter, U.S., let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned his right to citizenship. Citizenship is a perennial interest to historians, and some of its most vivid current discussions are in the field of African American history. Before the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1868, the U.S. lacked a formal definition of national citizenship. The legal historian Martha Jones has argued, when discussing the time before the 14th Amendment, that African Americans like other people who then lacked formal recognition of their rights, nevertheless reshaped understandings of citizenship. Jones says that they did this by arguing that they deserved full recognition as U.S. citizens, no matter what the law said, because they acted like U.S. citizens. One central way that they acted as citizens was through military service. During the U.S. Civil War, African-American men fought to join the Union ranks and thousands of African Americans aided the Union cause beyond the battlefield. Across the nation, Black men believed that they must join the effort to defeat the Confederate States of America, but they also confronted resistance to their initial offers of service. As soon as they could, they did participate in the Union War effort. Today, I'm going to briefly explore Black men's military service, Black women's and, and men's uh, war contributions, their wartime challenges and triumphs, 
and how they used their skills and experiences to gain political and civil rights in the post-war era. The struggle was just one operation in a much bigger and longer rights campaign both free and enslaved people fought. These are not historical abstractions. The current political climates in both Canada and particularly in the United States demonstrate the enduring relevance of defining citizenship rights, the relevance of unmasking and resisting systemic racism, the need to protect citizens' right to protest, and to state the super obvious, in these last weeks before a polarizing U.S. election, the need to protect the ballot box. From the founding of the United States and well beyond the Civil War, Americans of African descent lived in a society committed to white supremacy. There's abundant evidence that this is still the case now. But the antebellum U.S. was a nation in which people who identified as white could also claim citizenship privileges based on so-called whiteness. They could do this by distancing themselves from people whose skin color marked them as enslaved or as the descendants of enslaved people. Given that, it's significant that during those years, despite many obstacles, African Americans time and again demonstrated their commitment to the U.S. and their identity as Americans. They did not accept that the U.S. had this racist ideology. They didn't accept that it applied to them. Rather, they claimed for themselves the U.S. founders' ideals of freedom and equality, along with the nation's promise of democracy. They thus, through their activism, sought to prove that they were citizens and deserved recognition as such. For decades, free African Americans argued for their citizenship and that of enslaved people, and that the latter deserved freedom and rights. They organized in anti-slavery societies and political conventions. And then, of course, the Confederacy and the Union engaged in a massively bloody war from 1861 to 65, and this was a war that was strongly motivated by slavery. Most U.S. historians now agree that emancipation was not something handed down from above by Abraham Lincoln and his administration, et cetera, um, but rather emancipation was something which African Americans themselves played a very strong role in bringing about. They pushed the rest of their nation toward emancipation. African Americans saw war's outbreak as a sign that the end of bondage was on its way. And they said from the beginning that the war was about freedom, even as, of course, Lincoln and his administration presented it initially as a war about union. They chose self-emancipation despite the risks as soon as they could, and African Americans forced emancipation onto the table. And one of the ways that they did this was through their willingness to fight for the Union cause. So, <laughs> the fighting in the Union cause began in 1861 and black men organized regiments and tried to join up from the war's beginning, but the Lincoln administration had refused to accept them into the army. The legal basis for this refusal was a 1792 federal law that barred black men from bearing arms for the U.S. Uh, army. And I'll note that this was a law that came into play in 1792, but African Americans previously had already served in the American Revolution, and they had they also served in the War of 1812. Um, but nonetheless, this was the legal argument behind it. Uh, the Union Navy from the beginning was more willing to accept African Americans as sailors, um, but they had to fight for the right to join the Army. Frederick Douglass and many other African Americans saw the Equal Rights Cause as closely tied to military service. In that 1863 recruitment speech I mentioned a moment ago, he also argued, quote, nothing can be more plain, nothing more certain than that the speediest and best possible way to open, open to us to manhood, equal rights and elevation is that we enter this service. So he's making these very explicit connections between military service and the means to secure full rights for African-American men. Union policies on enlisting African Americans were very much informed by political and partisan concerns. 
several Union generals, including General David Hunter in South Carolina, enlisted black soldiers in 1862, but the Lincoln administration ordered them to stop, reversed their actions, and often punished these generals for these actions. So there's a good reason for this from Lincoln's perspective. He was a cautious politician in some respects, and he feared losing support of pro-slavery unionists, particularly in the essential slaveholding border states. So uh, this map here depicts, uh, it's a little more complicated than what we need, but basically um, the union states are in red, the, uh, the teal states, that's who I'm talking about here. These are um, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. These are states that held slaves, but they also stayed loyal to the Union. So unlike all the other states, those in gray and blue that eventually became part of the Confederacy, these states stayed in the Union, but they also had slaves. So <laughs> this is part of the reason why Lincoln can't have a radical abolition policy uh, early on in the war, because he's trying to keep these states from leaving the Union. Um, so Lincoln also feared that black enlistment would alienate white soldiers. And so he, his preference was to have a more gradual change in African-American status. Just like Frederick Douglass, Lincoln was also aware that African-American men becoming soldiers implied African-American men were becoming citizens. So nonetheless, <laughs> The war uh, eventually had immense, immense manpower needs. And in July of 1863, in response to that, the Congress passed one of a, a series of, of laws related to this, uh, the Second Confiscation and Militia Act. This act authorized the president to employ African-Americans in any capacity he saw fit. The union accepted African-Americans as support personnel like laborers and cooks before they let them in as soldiers. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863 only applied to areas in rebellion against the United States, but it nonetheless still facilitated black enlistment. Volunteers from South Carolina, Tennessee, and Massachusetts filled the first authorized black regiment. And in May of 1863, the government established a separate bureau to manage the growing numbers of black soldiers. By the summer of 1863, black recruiting was widespread throughout the North. So who were the soldiers who ultimately ended up serving in the Union Army? Most black soldiers were formerly enslaved people who joined the Army in the South. Some came from the Confederacy, and even more of them came from those loyal border states. And in these places, enlistment, or running away, if you could get away with it, was the only road to freedom during the war. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply in these border states, so this was what you had one of the ways you could get your freedom, even if you weren't directly motivated to fight, as many people were. The historian David Broadnack Sr., writing about Iowa's 60th U.S colored infantry has shown the direct connection between soldiers fighting and their citizenship claims. As was the case with a large number of African-American soldiers, many of the Iowa soldiers he studied had moved north from nearby Missouri before or during the war. Some soldiers volunteered and others were recruited more forcibly at the barrel of a gun. State and federal governments denied African-Americans the right to enlist in white regiments, and instead they created 166 segregated regiments for African-Americans. These had white officers leading African-American soldiers. The Union Army itself recruited black men in the South, although individual Northern states also sent agents as they wanted to boost their quotas with African-Americans. Many enslaved people in these areas were nonetheless ready to enlist and fled to Union lines. In 1864, Congress passed an act making all black men subject to military service and conscription. This allowed African Americans to gain their freedom in exchange for volunteering their military service. During the Civil War, approximately 200,000 African-American men served in the Union Army and Navy. 
This was 10% of Union troops over the course of the war. Nearly 40,000 enlisted African Americans died in the war. Uh, over 30,000 of them died of infection and disease, which goes to show the uh, high cost that those had. Other work for Union Army and Navy offered many freed people their first chance to earn wages. Over 400,000 African Americans participated in the Union War effort, and this was something that both women and men did. While Black women, like all women, could not formally join the Army, enlist as soldiers, etc., they still served as nurses, as spies, as scouts, uh, all sorts of jobs, and their ranks included, quite famously, Harriet Tubman. In June of 1863, Tubman, using intel gathered by her network of enslaved informants, led 150 Black Union soldiers in the Combahee River raid in South Carolina. It rescued 750 enslaved people and destroyed plantations, including many owned by leading secessionists. African Americans did other essential support work to maintain the Union Army. Some were not paid for their labor, and when they were paid, pay was often late or scant. Even among the enlisted men, the Army grossly underpaid Black soldiers, disciplined them more severely, and fed and clothed them poorly in comparison with white soldiers. They also faced deadly unequal treatment from Confederate soldiers and officers who placed them outside of the laws of war. They often denied black captives POW status and instead murdered them. But despite these very high costs and all of this unequal treatment, for formerly enslaved people, as for no other Union soldiers, the Civil War was a defensive war. They were defending their own homes, their own families, and their own liberty. I see that I'm frozen, so I'm just going to shut my video off for a moment and see if that uh, resolves it. Sorry for interrupting the flow. Perhaps I will not. Let us carry on. <laughs> Gina, I'm just going to jump in here from the control room and see that your, your video looks good on my end. Okay, so it's just looking frozen on my end. Uh, all right, sorry for the interruption. Thank you. So these types of widespread biases meant that the Union Army did not assign Black units combat duty as extensively as they might have. But still, African American soldiers served with distinction in a number of battles and received considerable notoriety after showing great heroism in combat. A very famous incident of this was the much admired um, actions of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Uh, they led the 1863 assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina. This was enormously deadly and nearly half of the regiment died in that battle. But the men's bravery convinced many Northerners that Lincoln had been right to use black troops in battle. This badge, which is in the collections of the Smithsonian, uh, belonged to the 54th Massachusetts E.A. Hill, uh, who was wounded in the assault on the fort. By the war's end, 16 black soldiers had earned the Medal of Honor for their bravery. So how do we assess the type of impact that African-American soldiers had. Despite the racism in the Union Army and the unjust treatment that they found from some Confederates, the military experience was largely a positive one. Formerly enslaved people and freeborn men both took pride in their service. Also, the news of emancipation was all the more joyful when it was delivered to enslaved people, as it often was later in the war in the coastal South, by African-American regiments. So African-Americans were able to come and free other enslaved people. Active participation in the war was an enormous boost to African-American self-respect. And veterans knew directly that African-Americans had not been given their freedom, but had fought for it. For many, military service established men as community leaders and opened the door to political advancement. This helped set new terms for post-war race relations. The Civil War ended in April of 1865, 
and the U.S. ratified 13th, the 13th Amendment in December of 1865, which abolished slavery throughout the Union. The war to preserve the Union had been won, but the war to free African Americans from the system of slavery was just beginning. Pre-war African American leaders continued to speak out for their rights during and after the Civil War, and they aided with the transition to freedom. In the 1860s, the stalwart fighters for African American equality across the U.S. refused to allow their battle to be stalled by the shifting priorities the war brought them. Activists continued to find their motivation in larger human rights struggles and to work towards securing legal equality for Black people. Citizenship definitions changed in the aftermath of abolition. People sought to redefine citizenship or, alternately, to keep such redefinitions from happening. So not only were they debating African-American men's rights, but also the rights of all women and of immigrants, they all came into question. So in a number of different ways, rights struggles were continuing, and Reconstruction's turmoil raised activists' hopes for equality to amazing heights, which then came crashing down over time. In the Civil War's aftermath, many Americans engaged in a fundamental debate over rights and who was entitled to them. And the limits of what most white Americans were willing to consider became obvious over time. Dismantling the Old South was an effort that ultimately proved incomplete. Emancipation was just the beginning of a struggle for making a definitive break with slavery, slavery's labor arrangements, family arrangements, and its cultural and racial practices. The central question after the war was, what should freedom mean? Should it mean partial citizenship, full citizenship? What would it mean? So well, let's explore that as I briefly discuss the recovery effort after the war and the effort to reintegrate the former Confederacy back into the Union. The Reconstruction period offered previously unimaginable opportunities for African Americans and for the nation. And it seemed truly to present the opportunity to realize the, the ideals of 1776, but this did not fully happen, or to the extent that it did, it didn't last. So why is that? Historians have been pretty clear on the fact that other legacies from the past compromised Reconstruction's two main goals. The goals of Reconstruction were to reunite the Union and resolve the situation with respect to African American status in society. Um, so, you know, resolving all of the things that grew out of the end of slavery. But these two goals were not always compatible and not all people wanted equality. While African Americans certainly gained rights in Reconstruction, its promises were largely temporary or unfulfilled, especially when we consider the longstanding economic inequality that persisted well after Reconstruction. During the war and after, African Americans continued to organize in political conventions that aimed to bridge North and South formerly free and formerly enslaved, uh, and people worked together toward securing political rights. So if we could go back about six months before the war ended, in October of 1864 in Syracuse, New York, 145 black leaders gathered together in a national convention. Some of the most prominent black activists attended, and they agreed that the basic beliefs of the American political tradition were sound, and you know, so it should, it should continue as it was, but they proclaimed that they would, were going to take a role in politics. They expected to take a role in politics and they were going to. Even before that Syracuse gathering, Northern Republicans had met in the Union controlled territory around Buford, South Carolina, and there they had nominated the South Carolina delegates to the 1865 Republican National Convention. They were met there to choose who was going to attend and represent South Carolina at that uh, next year's Republican convention. Among the delegates they selected were Robert Smalls and Prince Rivers. Um, both of these men were formerly enslaved and honored Union military men. If you're not familiar with the story of Robert Smalls, highly recommend looking him up. He's absolutely fascinating. Um, 
and goes on to a long political career after this. Um, so the probability of black participation in post-war politics seemed promising indeed. As the war ended, Lincoln was most concerned with reuniting the union, but he also gave cautious support for the vote for African-American men just three days before he was assassinated in April of 1865. The man who succeeded him, his vice president, Andrew Johnson, soon proved an unreliable ally for freed people. And he also quickly lost control over reconstruction to the powerful radical Republicans. So by 1867, they are steering the reconstruction in a more radical direction. In order for former Confederate states to be readmitted to the US under the 1867 Reconstruction Act, they had to allow black men to participate in forming new state constitutions and vote on them. So you can think of the Reconstruction Act as setting a series of hoops that you had to jump through if you wanted to rejoin the union, if you were a state that's, that had seceded. So African-American men had to be involved in forming the new constitutions and to vote on them. They also had to guarantee black male suffrage in these new constitutions, and they had to ratify the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment defines citizenship and guarantees equal protection under the law. But it's important to note that it did not guarantee the right to vote for all adult male citizens. It's about citizenship, not about the vote. While the Republican Party soon came around to the idea of enfranchising black men, this was a gradual process that proceeded unevenly across the nation. Many people logically focus on the post-war South as the area where abolition most dramatically transforms society and where the largest numbers of African-Americans lived. But it's also important to note that in areas of the North and the West, the vote for black men was highly controversial. To return to Iowa, historian David Broadnack Sr. shows us that soldiers on the verge of mustering out in October of 1865 met to support the cause of voting rights. They gathered together to rally in this cause as military men. In Iowa, they were successful, and Iowans voted to enfranchise African-American men in November of 1868, which was ahead of the 15th Amendment's ratification the following year excuse me, two years ahead of the 15th Amendment's ratification. But Iowa's unusual because between 1865 and 1870, 14 other Northern states and Washington, D.C. considered and rejected African-American enfranchisement. To give you a clearer sense of the lack of support for African-American voting rights in states outside of the South, while the 15th Amendment had enough states ratify it to become law in 1870, California and Oregon were among the states that refused to ratify the 15th Amendment until the mid 20th century. So it didn't matter, it had enough states to pass according to the, the necessary threshold, but they, those states made a symbolic statement that they did not support um, this uh, universal male uh, suffrage. So I mentioned this just to say that there's resistance to reconstruction across the nation. I'll be talking in a moment about, of course, more dramatic resistance to Reconstruction in the South, but it's not the only manifestation that we see uh, of resistance to African-American rights uh, in the 1860s and the 1870s. But before I bring the tone uh, back down again, <laughs> I, I, we can celebrate uh, some more uh, positive changes as well, because the mid to late 1860s were an unusual high point in African-American history in some respects. In this period, slavery is abolished. Black Southerners organized schools and churches, and throughout the South, they acquired a measure of political and legal rights that would have been impossible before the war. Yet they did not live in a utopia. Many freed people lacked land and had no realistic hope of getting any. White violence and cruelty ran rampant across the South. The 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, um, which of course provided the right to vote for male citizens regardless of race. But here it's also important to note a limitation of reconstruction. Black men put tremendous emphasis on getting the vote and only men got it. This is something that was under discussion at the time. Voting is 
constructed as a right of manhood in this time period. Um, and so women uh, were unable to rally sufficient people to the cause of their right to vote in this, in this era. So uh, many women had already, African-American women had been serving in those political organizations working for various types of rights and activism during the Civil War, but they were pushed out after the war as the Republican Party didn't welcome them. So partisan politics was less interested in the contribution of African-American women than some of the previous organizations had been. There's also some ways in which increasingly gendered roles within the family was also tied to black men's military service. So there's some ways in which extension of the vote and extension of additional rights to African-American men in the Reconstruction period created some disparities within the household um, between freed women and men's experience. I think it's important to look at some really impressive numbers when we're thinking about the political transformation of the South that grows out of the enfranchisement of African-American men. Um, so there's a massive politicization of formerly enslaved people. And this leads to uh, a huge number of new African-American leaders. About 2,000 African-American men held office, uh, public office during Reconstruction. And so this is an, a fundamental shift of power in the South and a radical departure in American government. You can see them at all levels of government in these Reconstruction governments, whether local or state or national. In terms of the national scene, there are 14 uh, men who serve in the House of Representatives in Reconstruction, as well as two senators from Mississippi. And the South Carolina legislature actually has an African-American majority during Reconstruction, which was in keeping with the fact that it's an African-American majority state in terms of its population at that time. So what kind of political agenda did black Southern politicians pursue during Reconstruction? What kinds of things did they try to do with this new power that they hadn't formerly been able to exercise? So they have some very sweeping goals, much as Reconstruction in general did. Um, they were trying to remove the economic control of the former slaveholder class. So um, in particular, they were very much interested in expanding their own rights to hold land, to own land and work it independently. Uh, they also wanted to eliminate all the discriminatory laws that they saw on the books in the South. They wanted to eliminate these black codes and in general, increase the democracy and modernize the economy uh, of their states that had formerly been just so reliant on, uh, you know, slave plantation agriculture. So in a lot of ways, we can see that the presence of African-American office holders and their white allies made a real difference in Southern life during Reconstruction. They gave more African-Americans a chance at getting a fair trial and at fairness in local government. Whether we look at things like road repairs, taxation, poor relief, you know, so many daily things that formerly they would have just been completely shut out of when they were holding the reins of power, they could increase access to them for other African-Americans. So while African-American men seated, succeeded in voting and holding office for several, for some years, most of them were pushed to the margins of politics by the late 19th century. And this is a part of an absolute, um, this is a, the effect of an absolutely concerted effort. White Southerners organized the birth of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1860s and continued through the early 1870s, and it directly targeted black rights and black political power. African-Americans not only confronted terrorists like the KKK, but many ordinary citizens went along with and countenanced the deprivations of African-Americans' political rights. Um, so ordinary citizens either assisted or stood by when others took direct measures like voter intimidation and destroying ballot boxes. So this really ambitious radical Republican vision of racial justice in a transformed Southern economy had never won the support of the majority of the Republican Party. 
Um, and it hadn't won the support of the majority of the northern public either. So it stayed a radical idea. Um, and the support for it was tenuous enough that when it became challenging to uh, continue its life in the South, uh, many people backed off. Violent action and voter suppression in the South, including targeted attacks on black veterans, meant many of Reconstruction's victories were short-lived. By 1877, the national retreat from Reconstruction was nearly complete. So this is an extremely disheartening development. Uh, and, but it's also important to see what nevertheless had changed over time. In the South, Reconstruction rearranged the relationship between the region's white and black citizens. The lives of many Southern African Americans changed drastically in Reconstruction, and they didn't entirely rebound to the ways that they had been, um, of course, back during times of slavery. So there were things that still had improved even after this backlash I've just explained. So we need to be nuanced as we assess Reconstruction. And we look at how people had built communities, uh, expanded their communities, and provided them with schools, new churches, all kinds of institutions. But it's also important for us to notice how even while it lasted, Reconstruction brought out some of the tensions in 19th century discussions of freedom and rights. So it makes us think, you know, as, as historians approach it, you know, how ought people to define freedom how did people at the time think about it? How did they decide who was entitled to rights? And how had these ideas shifted somewhat during Reconstruction, but not as far as perhaps we might expect? I say that because in a lot of ways, the old Southern power structure had pretty much regained power. And while African-Americans enjoyed more rights, they could not exercise many of them for nearly 100 years. This was thanks to a resurgence in white supremacy as expressed from the legislatures all the way down to the streets. Uh, and that brought disfranchisement along with segregation. To skip forward a few years, between 1890 and 1910, all of the Southern states moved to amend their state constitutions to disfranchise black voters. So they undid that provision that had been required to get readmitted back into the union. North Carolina's 1899 disfranchising amendment included a literacy test, grandfather clause, and a poll tax. And North Carolina and these other states did all of these things to take away African-American men's right to vote, while at the same time avoiding being prosecuted for violating the 15th Amendment. They could say, you know, oh, well, I'm not depriving this person on the basis of his race. I'm depriving him because, um, you know, he hasn't passed this literacy test. So this is just one example of how the U.S. in the aftermath of Reconstruction remained and remains divided in many ways. So even as you, you know, have uh, this strong push uh, from African-American men of invoking their military service, it only gets them so far in this time period. But it's also important to note that the nation had experienced a constitutional revolution. Um, so these amendments that I've brought up during this presentation were written as being very inclusive. So they provided the legal framework for civil rights in the United States that could later on be um, revived once the federal government started taking it more seriously. So Reconstruction in many ways contributes tools for later struggles with its memory of black participation, both in the military and in politics, a strong sense and continuing collective action in public life. And uh, again, just uh, people's maintaining the acknowledgement in their own communities of their military service in the Civil War. So one concrete thing that we can see coming out of these Reconstruction Amendments is that they altered the ways that governments thought about civil liberties. So that's a huge statement. But what I mean by that in this context is that the states could no longer assume that they were autonomous from the national government. So the 14th Amendment, by creating a concept of national citizenship, uh, gives the, the federal government the
the right to interfere to protect people's rights. And there are some fairly recent examples where the federal government has done this. Uh, the federal government is the body to which people can appeal for anything from civil rights violations in Ferguson to voting irregularities in Arizona in 2016. But I will also point out that both of those uh, interventions by the federal government took place uh, when President Obama was president. So it does depend who is president, um, who's leading the federal administration and what its agenda is. There are so many ways in which we can see slavery's legacy long, legacies long after its abolition. People were still debating the meaning of freedom and uh, still claiming white supremacy in so many ways. The changes in African Americans' status during the Civil War and the Reconstruction that followed were not merely forged in politics, but also by African Americans' actions on the battlefield in wartime. Soldiers and sailors' actions and arguments reinforced the U.S. government's obligations to them, including its obligation to protect them in the exercise of their citizenship rights. Military service proved an effective argument against the refusal of many Americans to grant African Americans legal protections for their safety and rights, although it was certainly not an irrefutable argument as African Americans' experiences in the late 19th century and beyond make clear. There is nonetheless a powerful activist through line for rights for people of African descent, and that is very much alive today. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Yes, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen um, once, uh, you know, this is a pretty picture if you can see that, but uh, I'm trying to make it, I, I am, I'm displaying myself as frozen, so it would be uh, wonderful if I could uh, stop looking at that, but I guess I can just ignore it. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, please proceed and I will, and you know, I'll just look at that pretty picture. <laughs> okay. Um, what, one of the questions I have, did any of the, the soldiers or, who gained the freedom, did any of them want to return to Africa? Uh, yes, I mean, there, there are, I don't have um, direct data on um, numbers of Civil War veterans who went on, uh, who, who joined the, um, um, I'm trying to, <laughs> coming up with the, the colonization movement, which is what it's called before the Civil War, the, um, the Garveyites, uh, you know, in the, the late 19th, early 20th century, things like that. Um, but uh, there is, my knowledge is that many, you know, like in the ideas that I was speaking about at the very beginning of the lecture, many people who um, felt a very strong sense of themselves as having, being entitled to rights as Americans, those folks didn't tend to have as much motivation to leave the country, both in the, uh, the pre-Civil War period and, again, the, the ideas behind the Garveyites. A lot of the motivation behind that is, is driven out of a sense of uh, the U.S. is never going to provide people with the rights that they deserve. So therefore, it's uh, best to move on to a society that will grant full respect uh, and equality. Um, but as far as specific instances of Civil War veterans um, going on into those movements, I'm not familiar with that, but that would be a really interesting thing to look into. I don't know if you're talking, Ken, but you're muted. <laughs> I know there were, there were segregated units, but did, did they ever have any integrated units of uh, black soldiers and white soldiers? Uh, in the Civil War, no, um, they they're, they're only, uh, pardon? Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, well, I will, I will attempt to, to answer and please follow up if, uh, if I haven't fully answered your question. Uh, the Civil War regiments were strictly segregated apart from the fact that they were led, um, the, the yeah, officers at the highest levels. Was, uh, what was, um, yeah. 
uh, sorry, I wasn't able to hear that. You just cut out. Can you repeat okay. that, please? Uh, Luke, do you have the ability to stop me sharing screen? I think that will probably help with some of these issues. Hi, Dana. Yeah, we've had a bit of a connection issue with your uh, with your stream, and I'm experiencing it with Ken a little bit. Um, I'm we're I'm not actually able to stop uh, your your slides from from sharing. Okay. Uh, but I think the connection issue is likely on our end. Uh, okay. And I'm going to see if I can get some questions uh, direct uh, from Ken uh, that I might be able to relay on to you. Okay. Um. Could, did you were you able to understand what he was just asking me? Um. Because I was. I, I wasn't. I can hear okay. you just fine, and hopefully everybody else uh, watching uh, and listening uh, can hear us as well. But I'm uh, I'm having a shaky connection with Ken as well. Okay. Um. Just quickly, would it break anything if I logged out and came back in? Um. Since I'm currently the host, is that might fix? I seem to have sort of crashed the program on my end. So. Yeah. I think uh, I don't think that should be a problem, and I'll uh, I'll uh, watch uh, for you to come back into this. Okay, thank you. I just, it would be nice if I was less frozen. So, um, all right, I will be right back. Sorry, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, everybody. Uh, just uh, stand by here while we uh, correct this problem. And just while we're uh, waiting for Dana to come back into the system, um, could you just test your uh, audio? We were we were having a connection troubles uh, with you as well just a little earlier. Uh, Ken, I'm just going to take you off mute here. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it sounds like your audio is back. Just bear with us, everybody. I'm just okay. waiting for uh, Dana to sign back in here. And if anyone has any Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I just uh, wondering if you might be having uh, some troubles uh, reconnecting here. Uh, folks, I'm just going to reach out to uh, Dina uh, through the uh, through the telephone and just see if there's uh, anything I can do here to speed this along. Dana, I think you should be back as a panelist. There yes, you thank you very much. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> this technology is not cooperating, um, but uh, thanks for everyone for waiting. Okay, we do have a, a few questions. We have one. Was there a full period of reconstruction, and what was it? Um, yes, definitely. Um, 
Reconstruction, broadly speaking, uh, extends all the way from 1865 to 1877, um, and, and it has a couple different phases. Um, I skipped over uh, presidential reconstruction um, because it's uh, the most moderate in terms of uh, African Americans' abilities to access political rights, et cetera. But um, radical reconstruction characterizes the period um, from about 1867, um, and then it starts to kind of fall apart in around uh, 1875 or so. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's that's what historians are talking about when they talk about the Reconstruction period. Uh, but it is, as you know, I hope I gave a little bit of a sense in, in the lecture. Um, it has many, many goals, um, and they're only uh, well, people disagree about what it ought to accomplish. And um, but it does um, make definitely some pretty substantial changes, even if they're not lasting. Can you talk a bit more about the changing gender dynamics in African American households after the war? Um, sure. I mean, there's a couple of different ways to to think about it, and I mentioned um, I just briefly mentioned one of them, um, which is just um, there's something very strange about um, households under slavery, even as um, slavery is this enormous atrocity that creates huge amounts of inequity for anyone who's enslaved. Within the households of enslaved people, there's actually, for the, you know, take, to take the example of the 19th century, for the time period, um, more equitable relationships between enslaved men and women than you would, than you would find um, in some other households. So I'm not at all arguing that there's anything good about being enslaved, but there is this kind of unusual circumstance of um, a greater degree of gender equity in many uh, enslaved households um, and what happens over the, um, the post-emancipation period is that, to some degree, there's a little bit more conforming with uh, sort of typical 19th century uh, gender roles uh, as far as um, a little bit more emphasis on male authority in the household. Um, and um, the example of the right to vote is obviously a huge one in that there are lots of ways, there's a, there are a number of people who've done really great research on this as far as women's uh, participation in certain types of informal politics during the war and the early reconstruction period that as African American men get more of a foothold within the Republican Party, um, women are less welcome as active participants as I, as I was mentioning. Um, so there's both sort of what's happening in the household and then what's happening in terms of uh, larger society. Okay, a, a question for me um, sort of follows on with that. Uh, when the African American males uh, were given the right to vote, were other visible minorities given the right to vote at the same time? Um, well, <laughs> uh, I will. I, I, hmm? Off topic a little. It might be a little aside. No, I mean it's it's interesting because I didn't. You know, again, uh, attempting not to talk about uh, too many different things in this this short lecture. I didn't get into the reasons why California and Oregon were opposing um, the Fifteenth Amendment, um, and it is to some degree somewhat about opposition to African-American rights, but they're, what they're really concerned about are uh, enfranchising um, the growing Chinese immigrant population and also um, their uh, indigenous populations. So um, the short answer to the question is no, um, but vote, because voting is predicated on citizenship and citizenship exclusions uh, apply in many cases to uh, Americans in this time period who are um, who are not white or African American. So um, yeah. <laughs> so the short answer to your question is that it's not uh, particularly liberatory in the short term, um, or doesn't particularly expand voting rights for um, other non-white people in that time period. But it does provide legal basis that people can eventually use to argue for for increased voting rights. Okay. Um, I think it covered, but I had a question asked. Uh, um, how many black soldiers were there in, in total, and how many black regiments were there? Um, so there were, I, I believe, it was 166 um, of the black regiments in uh, in the army. Um, I don't have specific numbers about the numbers of different regiments that African Americans were serving in the Navy. Um, so that would be something uh, to to look into further. Um, and um, yeah, I will consult my presentation because my brain is fantastic for remembering numbers. No, but about 200,000 um, 
total between the Army and the Navy. Um, the majority of those were in the Army, though, as far as uh, soldiers. Uh, most of them were soldiers, but there were some sailors as well. Okay. And one more question. Um, how is it possible not to see the war as an emancipation issue? What other reason was there to leave the Union? <laughs> Well, it depended who you asked, right? I mean, certainly, um, I, I, I think probably anyone who was either African American or an abolitionist um, would have defined it that way from the beginning as like, okay, finally we're getting our, our opportunity to um, teach the South what what's right when it comes to uh, the issue of slavery. But, um, you know, like I was hinting at when I was discussing um, lack of support for African American voting rights outside of the South, um, the U.S. Uh, still is a is a society, you know, in 1860, 1861, as the war is, you know, heating up and getting going, um, is a society in which um, the vast majority of people were not comfortable with an expansive notion of rights. So, um, you know, they would have thought, okay, it's criminal that the South is seceding. How dare they? Uh, do this, how dare they decide that they have their own right to to leave and go off and form their own country just because, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I make, I'm, I'm making, I, I'm, I'm attempting to argue that point, but I mean, I think I always, I always say, you know, people, you know, some people say, you know, oh, it's not about, um, it's not about slavery, it's about states' rights. Well, <laughs> the states' right issue, rights issue is that the southern states perceive, um, the North or the Republicans or whoever their particular, um, you know, focus is as trying to take away their right to hold slaves or dictate their economy. So states' rights and slavery are not two different arguments. They're very closely related. <laughs> okay, and I have one question. And uh, uh, after the, the war, um, how did the, did the African Americans uh, provide their own schooling for their kids or how was there funding for their schools and education? for uh, the people afterward after the war yeah there's a there's a number of different things that that happen um, even though um, constitutionally the education is something that's decided by the states um, and still is today if uh, those of you who ever have ever have ever wondered why the US the different states have such different situations with respect to education funding all these kinds of things it's it is a, a power that the states hold but in the out in the after, during and after the Civil War there's an exception to that which is their um, are Freedmen's Relief uh, organizations that are well both federally uh, funded and then also uh, individual charitable efforts, um, many of them led by um, African American Northerners um, who you know come into the South and form schools um, or train teachers, um, and then the teachers go back to their um, their communities in the South. So it's um, education is something that African Americans. Um, themselves are funding locally sometimes, other African Americans from outside or other philanthropists from outside are also funding, but it's also something that the that the government is funding at least during reconstruction to some degree. So it is um, one of the great successes of reconstruction in some respects um, and probably something that uh, I should devote a little bit more attention to myself as I'm thinking about uh, you know, I, I, because I focus so much on politics in my own research, it's always what I'm thinking about. But, um, but yeah, there certainly are uh, lots of ways in which education is absolutely transformative, especially to a population that, uh, you know, wasn't allowed to learn to read um, while they were enslaved. Okay, thank you. I'll wrap it up there. Um, I want to thank you for a really thought-provoking and really informative talk. It's it's a lot of my questions and, and opened up a lot more. <laughs> ideas for for me. Um, so, and I just want to remind people that the, the talk has been recorded and it will be posted on our, our museum website and our social platform. Uh, and our next lecture coming up on Thursday, November 26th at 7 o'clock is Dr. Alex Sushin, uh, who's presenting a talk on war junk, uh, munitions disposal, and post-war reconstruction in Canada. So I think that'll be uh, another fascinating talk. Um, and I also want to mention that if you enjoy these lecture series and you haven't signed up, uh, contact uh, Guelph Museum's um, website at uh, museum at guelph.ca and you can get uh, registered for our contact list for the talk so you can uh, pick up on all these talks whenever they come up. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight 
And thank you again, Dana. It was really a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a great night.